Hello, uh, this is the second in a three-part uh, webinar series um, titled DevOps Disruptors. Um, across the series, we are going to be looking at a report by the analyst firm Omdia exploring platform engineering as an emerging organizational approach and how it may be disrupting DevOps. I'm Nick Peacock, I'm Senior Director of Customer Success here at CloudSmith, uh, and momentarily I'm going to be joined by uh, two experts who between them have at least a couple of decades um, experience implementing and managing DevOps uh, across a number of organizations. Um, we're going to be discussing and you'll be hearing about their, their own journeys, the experiences in DevOps and platform engineering, and the, how they are reacting to changes in environments and changes of business objectives um, using the maturity model that the UNDEA report uh, uses. We're going to discuss how to assess your organization's maturity in DevOps and platform engineering um, and how you make necessary changes. Um, with that, we're going to try to keep it all within the next 45 minutes or so. Um, we're going to be calling for some audience participation, so please feel free to, to join in and answer any questions. Um, a couple of quick plugs. Um, if you missed the first session, please go back and have a listen. Uh, it was hosted by Glenn Weinstein, the CloudSmith CEO, who, um, who hosted Alan Carson, the co-founder and chief strategy officer at uh, CloudSmith and um, Humanitex VP of Product and Growth, Luca Galante, uh, where they dug into and debated the points that were raised by the authors of the report. Um, and if you're not already registered for the next in the se uh, series um, and the last rounds, uh, you can see the banner at the bottom here. Um, it takes place on the 21st of August at 12 p.m. ET. Uh, either scan the QR code or go to cloudsmith.com. Um, our VP of product, Alison Selecki, and uh, Rob Godfrey, senior art, technical architect at the Financial Times, are going to be dis discussing um, that with the evolution of DevOps. And there's going to be a focus to um, and shift to creating internal development platforms um, and how you offer self service capabilities as developers. Uh, but on that note, I want to welcome our panelists. Richard Vodden, who is the VP of Technology at Unitizing Autonomy, and Dave Bradley, who is Senior Manager at PagerDuty. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking part. Um, so, Dave, I'm going to start with you. Um, as a leader in SRE and DevOps at PagerDuty, what can you tell us about what DevOps means to you? Um, and how did you come about platform engineering as an approach or methodology? Um, well, I think one of the interesting things when I started at PagerDuty was in the environment here was a lot different from other places that I've been to where it fully embraced, this was years ago, the full source ownership model. So there was, you know, code it, ship it, own it. Um, teams were running fully operational autonomous services and that, to be honest, that was part of, that was gotten to be a bit of a problem. Um, I think maybe when you're in a growth mode and you're under a hundred developers, as we were at the time, it's okay if you have multiple data stores running around, or if you have teams running their own container schedulers in certain circumstances. But as we were growing, we found that that was not going to be scalable. And I think one of the things I did and that was encouraged to do was to go around and talk to stakeholders and go to and talk to other folks and engineering managers, senior and individual contributors and say like, hey, what's, you know, what can we do to help, right? Like what can infrastructure do to help you? And so getting that feedback from the folks who are your customers, your internal customers was critical because one of the things that they kept saying was, we want more standardization, we want more paved roads. And that's kind of what we've been building towards because I think sometimes a DevOps model can be, I've heard of some organizations um, some folks that came to page of duty where they have, you know, the self-sufficient teams with embedded SREs. Um, so that could be one direction you can go, right. As you grow, whereas just like you can make the teams fully autonomous. But I think what we wanted to do was different, which was to have provide centralized capabilities that could be shared by the rest of the organization. And so that's what we started building towards. And we, you know, uh, progressively we would do customer interviews every year. Last year we started doing developer surveys too. And so getting that feedback internally to make sure that we were on the right track, but also trying to stay current with the trends that were going around in terms of what's capable, what's out there for infrastructure, but also being guided by our own vision of what we wanted to provide to the org. Um, it's a combination of all those things. And so I think we stumbled into platform engineering because I didn't, <laughs> I think I mentioned to you and Richard before is that 
you know, went to KubeCon last year and I was like, whoa, this is this is what we've been trying to do, you know, and you're kind of watch, seeing it play out and it's an actual thing and there's a discipline and CNCF has written documents about it. So I think we've been trying to do platform engineering without knowing that it's what the title is. But also, you know, I think the thing I want to stress is I think it's the import, it's what our organization needs and wants. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that maybe in, to answer your original questions, part of what you need to figure out about your DevOps journey is what is the need that you, you need to satisfy for your organization. And that could be different based on the organization. It could be different at different times for the same organization. So um, that's my two cents. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You you spoke a lot about the kind of the internal team collaboration and um, a um, aspiration for standardizing and creating centralized capabilities. It sounds like there was an inflection point there. Um, was that kind of a natural inflection point, or was that uh, like a formal process? Did someone stand up at nine a.m. on a set uh, on a Monday morning and say, "Hey, we need to do platform engineering, or we need to do better"? What what did that kind of inflection point look like for you? Um, I wouldn't say it was an epiphany of any sort on anybody's part. It was very gradual and it was very gradual depending on the teams too. We had some teams that at first really embraced, it's like, take our data stores. We don't want to run a container schedule, right? Like at the extremes, right? Like they, they, they wanted, they were willing to give up some of their autonomy in order to get, to have less operational burden and to have sort of distributed expertise or have us be able to have capabilities that could be shared across the org. Other teams are a bit more reluctant, right? They didn't want to give up their own ability to control the technologies that they were using. Um, but over time, I, I just think, you know, you use metrics and you use surveys to show that there's a productivity advantage and there's also a morale advantage to, to, to making this shift, especially as you're growing. It's just, you can't have you know, as you're scaling from at the time we when I started, we were about 400 people. Now we're like 1400. Right. And so from 100 developers to 400 developers. So at that scale, you're, you know, at those scales, it just wouldn't make sense to keep going the same way that we were going. And I think now it's, it's not there's not even a question, really. It's like take more of our <laughs> abstract, more things away from us. Give us more centralized capabilities. Like we don't we don't want to worry about this stuff. So I, I think it's gradual. I don't think. I don't think there was something uh, that was a top down or that was sort of everyone woke up and said mm -hmm. like, yes, we're going to do it this way tomorrow. It took time. Yeah. So, it, I mean, I, I know I asked the question around an inflection point, but it doesn't seem to be any single point. It was a kind of a gradual thing as you scaled. Um, and, and Richard, I know like you, uh, you and the guys that help humanize and autonomy are scaling. Did you implement platform engineering from the start based on growth from other businesses? How, how did that, uh, not, I, I keep wanting to call it an inflection point, but how did that, how that journey kind of um, work for you? Um, we definitely didn't do it from the start. Um, I joined about just over two years ago, which was, I think, three years into the company's journey. So we're now about five years old, if I've got the, the numbers right. Um, we're 22 people, so a kind of order of magnitude down from where, from where you are, Dave. Um, and traditionally, you might think that actually platform engineering has, has no relevance at, at that kind of size. And I'd certainly take that as an argument, even if I strongly disagree with it. I think um, Dave hit the nail on the head around what DevOps is, the code it, ship it, own it bit, um, is, is absolutely what that is about. You know, we're no longer having a dev team and an ops team. That's what it is. It's that portmanteau of dev and ops. Um, and an innate kind of conclusion of that is you end up having teams that need to have all of the capabilities that that team needs to be able to deliver um, up to a point and it's that up to a point where platform engineering becomes really interesting so um, one extreme example might be do you have an air conditioning engineer in your dev team for when the data center air can fails no of course you don't and in that particular instance you've kind of taken the ultimate platform engineering approach of, of buying a SaaS, presumably. I mean, I guess we're probably all using cloud. And at that stage, you know, a cloud provider is basically, or even CloudSmith, you know, a SaaS product. Absolutely, that is a platform. And what we're talking about here is building internal platforms. And I think um, to build on what Dave was saying, a few, there are two parts that kind of, to me, say you are doing platform engineering um, and you're not just doing engineering, if you see what I mean. The first one is, 
that that platform team must be absolutely focused on self-service. So what we don't want to do is go back to the days of having, you know, one team raise a ticket on another team and get them to do some work. Like let's say we've got a database team. You don't want you don't want your dev team raising a ticket on the database team saying, please, can you can you raise me a database, please? That's that's just an ops team, right? That's not a platform team. Um, so what they should be doing, in my opinion, and what I found very, very effective, even at the tiny scale, and I'll, I'll get on to exactly how it works in a second. Um, by empowering the dev team to create a database without needing the knowledge to know how to create a database, you get that standardization that Dave was talking about because it's the database team that control the bit that creates the database. They're all created in exactly the same way, but you don't get that handoff. So the dev teams get to decide when the database is created and when it is destroyed and when it's powered up and when it's, you know, you can add features to it. And the other thing which I found particularly effective um, and a, a mark of platform engineering, and we see it in SaaS providers as well, is this idea of inner sourcing. Um, Dave, you talked about autonomy and control. Um, and I think, you know, de de te dev teams not wanting to let go of that autonomy and control. One thing we've done really, really well at humanizing and also in a couple of other organizations I've worked in is you, you basically open source the product internally. You say, here is the platform, there is the source code. If you want autonomy and control, you want a feature, the platform team can't deliver it in time, raise a PR. And so if you have that sense of openness and collaboration combined with that sense of self-service first and kind of an almost complexity firewall, then you're doing platform engineering. Even if you're doing it as one guy writing a Terraform module that's driven by YAML files, which is very much the stage we're at at humanizing, that's still platform. It doesn't have to have a fancy GUI and a, a load of um, pretty metrics behind it. Um, does that answer the question? I think it kind of does. I think it does, yeah. I, I, I think the, the kind of takeaway I have is that the, the principles of platform engineering are not different really to the fundamentals of uh, DevOps. It is still code it, build it, ship it, but it is, it is a shift in the paradigm with, um, the problem you were solving, uh, I guess, probably back in 2009, probably when DevOps really started to rear its its head, it was to try to provide centralized services for a whole organization as it scaled in complexity or size. Platform engineering is the, um, I guess, the older, more experienced brother um or sibling of that uh of that function where okay well we've we've proved that we can build these things but now the developer teams want great friendship they want great collaboration you you can't have a air conditioner every single team so you you obfuscate those out um and i i think it was Michael phone so to speak I think a big piece here is how do you how do you know where to start? How do you say, okay, well, I, I haven't yet solved my uh, Nirvana of DevOps yet. How do I evolve myself into pl a platform engineering function? Um, I, I guess the not so simple question I'm going to pose to you both is where do you start, or where did you start? Um, we started, it, and, and maybe let me give you some guides. Okay, first, I say maybe give you a guide. Is it? Is it is it tooling first? Um, is it process first? Is it culture first? I've never done it tooling first. I'm not saying that doesn't work. Um, it's not an approach I've ever tried. Um, the way I tend to look at it, um, if, if we are in a situation where we're going, right, we're going to do platform engineering, which as Dave alluded to, is not something that's ever really happened. I think platform engineering is more of a natural evolution of what DevOps is. Um, what I look at is the proportion of time the team, let's assume you're running a team, um, you look at that team, think, look and measure the proportion of time they're spending on roadmap versus spending on things aside from roadmap. Um, John Cutler calls it um, Lodo or lights on doors open. Also heard it called toil. Um, and that it's going to happen. But if it's more than kind of 10% of what you're doing, then there's kind of an alarm bell there in, in my mind. And you'll start thinking, actually, maybe we've got too much to do here. Maybe we've got a body of work here that somebody should be given ownership of. And you, it might be within the team even. You kind of have a little platform team within your platform team, or within your within your dev team. Um, 
and and then it's ticket analysis. What what is that toil? Um, when I was at EMAD, the the huge thing was database snapshot restores. I think we had something stupid like six and a half thousand tickets in the DevOps backlog, whatever a DevOps backlog is, um, and about a third of them were. Can you please restore this database snapshot, please? And so there's there's a very very obvious place to start, and that that is often the case in my experience. Is there are real pain points that are exactly that handoff that DevOps is trying to move away from, and you can tackle those in a API first kind of way. To the extent that we've even I've even written APIs which just raise Jira tickets, so that you get the API sorted for the, the dev team to be able to interact with it, and then it's done manually while you sort the automation out in parallel. Um, Dave, where did you start from? Uh, well, I think one of the things I really like about working in infrastructure that also makes it really hard is that you are not only engineers, you're also product managers a lot of times and salespeople and marketers internally because your customers are inside and you don't have those functions as part of your infrastructure work typically. So a lot of it falls onto you as managers, but also onto your engineers, right? Like the program management, project management, product management functions are all within your org. So uh, my roundabout way of answering this question is like, you have to figure out that you asked which one would you start with first? And I think my, part of my answer would be, it could be more than one. So one of the first things I mentioned was I started talking to folks around the leaders around the org to try to figure out where the pain points are, right? So that's key. You want information from your customer base to understand what it is, like what the high leverage things you can address can fix. Um, but, you know, also you listen to your own team and the expertise you have for folks who, from folks who are, who know infrastructure. So one of the things with folks on my team were telling me is that this was years ago, uh, and they're like, we need to implement infrastructure as code. Because at the time, all we were doing was EC2 instances provisioned via chat ops and Slack, that kind of thing. And they're like, like and, I, and I said, okay, well, let's do it. So we brought in Terraform, right, like via Atlantis and uh, as far as CD tooling. And, you know, when we did that, we, um, that enabled us to allow developers to self-service infrastructure within AWS directly, rather than using the CLI or rather than using the console. And by doing that, our adoption of AWS managed services and the, uh, the, the, the efficiencies that were gained by the developers increased a lot. So that in that aspect, we started with tooling first. We were like, we have to onboard Terraform in order to unlock these capabilities for our developers. But we also had other initiatives where you're like, okay, where are the, they're like, oh, our builds are too slow. Our deploys are too slow. That's what we were getting from the, uh, you know, we want to be able to create services, you know, and not take a, a month. We want it to take a week, right? So those are the, we can address those as well. So you, you can, you can do a mix of both. Obviously you don't have unlimited folks on your team because <laughs> there's so much you can do. Sometimes you want unlimited folks, but I mean, I, th I think it can be a mix of approaches depending on what the needs are of your business. And that's, up to you to figure out. And I think, I think that's probably one of the tough parts, but also one of the parts I like about the job is that, you know, we have that level of autonomy or the level of, you know, we can do we, we, the level of responsibility, but also the impact is really great. That's what I like about working in infrastructure is your impact isn't just one feature you're shipping. Everything, almost everything you do has impact across the organization. I worked in a place that had a career ladder um, and it talked about the impact of individual engineers at different ranks being part of these ranks. And at, at principal level, it was regularly makes changes which have a significant impact across the organization. And I'm like, my juniors are doing that every day. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a fantastic place to work, isn't it? I feel the same way. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that, I, again, that kind of a res this resonates, it sounds like with a pair of you where you're trying to solve a problem uh, maybe a kind of a transactional problem at scale with um, the process of building and delivering software. Um, whether that's kind of for distributing to other companies or just internal software or internal processes. Um, I, I, I guess the, I, I want to take, um, I want to change tact a little bit and say, how has this change that you've been delivering? And how has that impacted your need to change your to a platform engineering team or, or whatever kind of um, name or um, methodology you put against to it? 
I, I think in the in the modern world with, uh, I'm not going to use AI as buzzwords here, but with, with more kind of generative software development, um, people are using and deploying to containers more frequently. You're deploying to Kubernetes uh, environments, um, pulling and using more open source software than ever before. Um, I, I think the, the breadth and scope of software um, kind of in control uh, and software under use by organizations is just a kind of skyrocket right it's, it's exponentially more sophisticated complicated uh, much larger how is that scale not necessarily with the organization in terms of number of developers or number of problems how do you think the um the evolution of software has impacted um what devops is or what platform engineering um, becomes from from devops um i think if you don't mind I'll, i can answer first i I'm trying. I think one way I can answer your question is you have to have standards. So you have to restrict. Richard talked a lot about self-service, but you have to restrict what that what the capabilities are of that self-service in order to provide. You know, to, you can't provide a platform that's a platform for everything and that anyone can get any software they want at any time because that's not supportable. <clears throat> that's not sustainable. You need to be able. You need to say we're going to focus on these things. This is this is the menu that you get, and we're going to and and we're going to optimize that menu so you get all these things out of the box when you get when you self service this thing whether it's software or a platform or a capability in some way shape or form so i think that one of the key things and again that's that was a tough thing to do transitionally where it was everybody was used to just saying i need this technology so therefore i'm going to use this technology to okay now i have a limited menu of things i'm going to do but they're going to be well supported right so i, I think that's the key is that is there a cultural transition that can occur where people realize that having this self-supported or this well-supported technology is better than me being able to self-service, even though it may not fit 100% of my use case, it fits 90% and I get all these extra things for free, right? It's like, it's the same thing as is us get by, buying a managed service from the cloud, right? It, maybe it's not 100% of everything that we wanted, but there's a reason why we're not running something on on prem. There's advantages to it um, most of the time, um, but in, in this case, I think that has a lot to do with it. You have to restrict. You have to restrict, and I think the thing I want to add to the self service bit that's tricky, and I think is part of what's hard about platform engineering is you have to figure out how far to abstract, and that's a tricky thing too, right? So it's not just self. You can't. You're not self servicing 100% of everything. There's certain things that you want the developers to not care about because it's inefficient for them. And also you, the expertise you have is in-house, like you, you, the infrastructure team will have more expertise on certain things. So, you know, how far do you want to get? Do you want to get to, I saw this talk at KubeCon last year from Tim Hansen at Spotify, where it was like, they just have four YAML files. And it's like, one's a build YAML, one's a deploy YAML. And that sounds awesome. Like I, I want, but so what it, you know, you know, we're a ways away from that. Right, um, we're we're sort of in Terraform module land right now, which is tricky because then developers need to know Terraform. But do we want to abstract Terraform away from the developers. We kind of do, but it's a long journey. And then how much bang for the buck are you going to get? So you have to figure that part out of it too. And I'm not sure. I may have taken your question in a different direction, Nick. But so I apologize. But hopefully, I kind of answered it. I think. Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, Gone, Richard. Oh, cool. I think you nailed it. In, in, in I guess opinionated self-service is what I'd describe it as, where you're like, okay, you're not just able to buy anything you want. You can only buy the things that we sell, um, I guess, which um, an approach I found to kind of keep it under control um, is you have some non-negotiables and you, you, you it's a, one of the tenets of, of platform engineering is, is kind of as a product, right? So we, we don't want to tell people they have to do things. We, we want to compel them to, to use it. The, the platform should be so amazing that, the, that everybody wants to use it. Um, but again, you got to do that within certain constraints. So what I've found is actually, if you constrain the code repository and you say, right, you must put your code in whatever code repository provider. Uh, you must put your artifacts, obviously, in CloudSmith, because you wouldn't ever consider any other cloud, uh, any other artifact um, product. Um, you must use our cloud account, 
if you're building a SaaS product, and then your alerts must end up in, let's say, Page of Duty. Um, and those are your four non-negotiables, right? Um, and then the platform team provide almost approved ways of working, off-the-shelf products that get you from your code repository into CloudSmith. And like you might have, right, we've got a Python one, we've got a C++ one, we've got a um, JavaScript one. And then if somebody wants to do something else, they're free to. Um, and that's a great way of giving you a metric that says how, what proportion of the organization actually are making use of the products that we've provided? You know, how effective is it? And also it means that you're not stuck on the rails. You're not kind of going, oh, we're only going to use, I don't know, poetry for Python because that's what we've done. Someone can come along and say, oh, actually, I think this other Python build tool is, is amazing. I'm going to give it a try. They try it. It works. And there's a clear route to upstream because you've got it kind of, you're, you're not building something that's so tightly coupled that um, it's got no flexibility at all. And then you, you can elevate that. But it will get enthusiasm and encourage it. And you're no longer saying, don't do that. You're saying, no, crack on. Give it a go. See if it works. By the way, we require from an interface between code and artifact there to be a tag on the commit and that tag to match the version number in CloudSmith. You know, you, you go, this is what your contract is that you must adhere to and then let them innovate, let them crack on. Um, and then if it's good enough, upstream it. Go, this is fantastic. And let them then be effectively become the product owner for that product um, as, as it grows. And they're still like, this was my idea and it's grown up. And that's very, 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 very powerful. Um, and helps kind of almost present an illusion of freedom, if you like, because um, by the time you spent sort of 18 months, two years working on these off the shelf components, they are so amazing and so whizzy and so clean that actually it's, it's a pretty tough hurdle to build something that's better. Um, it does definitely happen though. And it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling when it does happen. You get a contribution from a team that are sort of two levels of indirection away from infrastructure. Like, oh, I've built this thing that deploys RDSs and it only takes four minutes, not eight. You're like, oh, that's cool. Um, I remember when at EMAD when we got the first PR to our, to our platform, that was such an exciting moment. And um, Nick, you were talking about sort of cultural things to look for. That's, that's really one where... Um, it's no longer the case that the platform team own the platform. The platform team are like the, I don't know, museum curators. They're there to sort of to help people get around the platform and to make their experience as, as easy as possible. But it's not really their museum. The museum is the museum of the people. It's not really platform team's platform. It is the platform of the company, if that makes sense. It, it does. It, it's interesting. I... Um... I, what kind of keeps coming back to me is that there's an element of maturity here, whether this is kind of a maturity of tooling, of process, of um, organization. Coming back, is that kind of culture and process? Does does one lead the other or does the other lead the other? Um, like, does the culture lead the processes? Does the process lead the culture? And I think that's different for different companies. Uh, I'm sure, Richard, how you operate is, is different from Dave, but no, no less or no more. Um, I, I, I guess my next question that I'll pose to you both and pose to everyone um, in a poll as well is um, how mature do you feel like your organization's processes are? Um, I, I, I won't necessarily get you to, to speak about the, the good and the bad and the ugly um, or, or let any um, external kind of secrets out uh, into the world, uh, but maybe just speak in general in terms of kind of the, 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 mature, the maturity of a process versus the maturity of a, a culture that is um, willing to um, uh, uh, hand over the reins to a platform engineering team to solve those problems that traditionally potentially developer teams have tried to solve themselves or have wanted to own. I think maybe Richard, this is the maybe first first punt for you. Um, I think if you have the right culture, you don't need process at all which is a controversial thing to say. And that's probably an extreme end. Uh, and I'm not sure anyone ever quite gets to that extreme. Um, I think, um, for example, um, you talk about ownership there and, and you talk about the platform team owning problems and solving them. Um, I think if the culture is right, 
there should be a sense of collaborative ownership between the dev team and the and the platform team and they 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 it shouldn't be a sense of oh this is the platform team's problem they need to go and solve that because that's not ours anymore but that's obviously you know a, a pr pretty um impressive place to have got to and certainly not something i've ever fully achieved um and i i think process is a helpful way to provide guidelines and guardrails around areas where you perhaps can't rely on your culture to, to for all kinds of reasons. There might be regulatory reasons why you can't just go, oh, no, the culture's fine, we can do this, because you, you know, certainly, um, if, if I said to an accounting system, you know, oh, we're just gonna rely on culture, we're not gonna do any process, then that, that would not wash. Um, and however, I think, if you imagine taking it to an extreme where you have, I mean, you've got here fully matured and optimized processes, what are those processes? Are they really, are we, are we now coding by numbers? Have we taken all of the decision making away from the developers? Um, and I feel like there's a sweet spot or a sweet zone, I guess, because it's definitely not a single point where you've got some situations, for example, um, our production system has gone down. Um, none of our customers can get to any of their information. That's a situation where you really need a process. Um, it can be as light touch or as complex as you like, but something needs to be there to say, okay, what you do is you do this. This gets you an incident manager assigned. This is what happens after that. Bang, 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 bang. And that's about, that's about expediency more than anything else. And then um, there might be other situations like we want to experiment with a new way of building python to pick my analogy up before and that's something where you can let the culture rely on the on the process on the sorry let the the sort of naturally evolving process come out of the culture if you see what i mean so i think in an ideal world process is culturally led however that's a idyllic utopia that probably doesn't exist anymore and in reality you know regulation exists for good reason and process kind of has to cover that off and also there are situations sometimes where you just don't have time to let let the culture work out what to do and so yeah you kind of do need to do that um dave uh sure with an organization a couple of orders of magnitude bigger than mine you've got a slightly different view i, don't, I, I can't say i strongly disagree with you though i mean i think the, the challenge for us like if i say culturally speaking we we have embraced what whatever platform engineering means today or DevOps, et cetera. But uh, what I could tell you pragmatically is like, we just don't have enough folks to implement all the things in the platform that we would like to have. Like, I would, and is that a process question that I would like more headcount? <laughs> but, you know, because there's all sorts of cool things that we can unlock <laughs> for the organization to say like, hey, we could do all this stuff for you. It just, there's only so many things we can do with the people that we've got. So I think culturally speaking, people are bought into like, yes, provide us more things out of the box abstract more things away from us, give us mobility to self-service more things. But there's only so much we can provide in any given year. And to Richard's point about regulation, I mean, going through the FedRAMP authorization process has really, you know, like if you say, if you want your platform, your self-determined platform standards to seem less onerous, then go through a compliance or regulation process because then you'll look like less bad, right? Like you'll say like, hey, look, at least, you don't have to go through all this other stuff. Um, I mean, I think for all the things that FedRAM put on log for us, it is added a lot of compliance work that we have to do in our software development lifecycle process. And that does impact that does that is that does impact the process and maybe to a certain extent the culture because we can't our, our we still encourage experimentation. It's just the question is when you want to get that experiment into something like a production environment, now it's a little bit more challenging, right? Like you, there's a lot more things you have to go through. So that does slow things down, can slow things down a bit. Um, so that does, that is a culture impact, right? So as you grow and you make these business decisions, but that's the decision the business has decided, you know, to go into and open up the federal market for ourselves, not just the federal market, but there's a lot of other customers who are like, Hey, if you're FedRAMP certified, then you don't have to worry about, you know, other compliance or security uh, certifications, et cetera, it's sort of like the gold standard, especially for a lot of companies here in the US. 
So there's a lot of things that it unlocks for the business and it makes a lot of sense, but there is an impact to your software development lifecycle that needs that you need to acknowledge and, and somewhat embrace, right? Like there's certain things that FedRAMP has forced us to do, like vulner we have a, a great vulnerability management program now. Like all of our, you know, things get patched regularly. People keep their softwares up up to date a lot more than we did before. I mean, people would be, you know, three, four year old libraries that they, you know, they hadn't worked on a service in a while. They bring it in and all of a sudden they're spending two weeks just trying to resolve dependencies. It happens less frequently now. So there are some some benefits that are provided by going through this, but it's it's all intertwined, I guess is what I'm saying, Nick. It's not it's hard to tease one out from from the others. That is a great platform yeah, I, I, prop though, isn't it? Where you're saying, you know, we've got all <laughs> this regulatory nonsense that we have to go through so that we've got this compliance. If you use our platform, you only have to worry about this bit of it, not yes. that bit. If yeah. you do your own thing, you're welcome to come to the audit with us. Okay. <laughs> See how quickly well exactly, right? Because yeah. I think now the problem is folks have to go jump through a lot of hoops to get these exceptions, right? Yeah. So they just end up using me. Now, does that make you lazy as a platform provider? It, sh it shouldn't, right? I mean, your your goal ultimately should be to serve your customers in the business. And so, you know, you just have different constraints to work under. Um, but like, like you said, it, it does, it does make, it, I think it puts the onus on you though, to say, can we abstract more? So that, that that maybe the pain is lessened for those folks that need to, need to use the platform that we're providing because now everybody has to use it, right? So what can we do that's going to have the most impact throughout the organization? Um, so you, you know, it kind of shifts the way you look at things, but I don't think it shifts our mission. Do you find it tricky? Oh, sorry, Nick, if I can ask you a question. Is it, given, no, given you're in a regulatory position and you kind of do have that organizational mandate where people have to use your platform how do you stay honest and keep it product led and keep it compelling and not kind of go oh well everyone has to use it we don't we don't need to we don't need to make it awesome uh i mean we have great people working in the org i, I want to start with that right like we we don't have folks who are just want to punch the clock and check. there's people who are really legitimately interested in advancing our platform and advancing the technology um and the other part, I, I can't stress, there's two, th it's not just, there's there's multiple aspects to figuring out how effective you're being. And, and one of them is, I think, talking to your customers. So developer surveys, interviews with folks, speaking to folks around the org, seeing where their pain points are, that never should change. Like you should always be getting feedback from the users and subjective feedback. So if you look at all the DORA and space metrics stuff, they all say you need that subjective feedback to round out the metrics, but you also need the metrics, right? So I hadn't mentioned before. So it's like, where are, are we, you know, our deployment times going up or is our cycle time going up? Is like, what can we do to, to, to help fix that? Um, I don't know, I guess it's hard to answer your question. Uh, theoretically, I suppose you could just kind of mail it in. Um, I'm luckily, I, I, I don't think that's the type of folks that we have here. In fact, like I was, it's hard because I feel like folks want to do more. And I think that's the challenge sometimes of the, like I said before, I wish we had more people because we could provide more to the org because people want to give more, provide more to capabilities as part of the platform. And, uh, you know, I think that's the challenge with the, when you're in infrastructure and platform engineering, you have a certain level of keep the lights on work that you have to do. And so if your organization is smaller, the percentage of keep the lights on work that you have to do is maybe higher than you'd like. And you can't invest in the platform capabilities as much as you'd like. And I think that's, there's a bit more keep the lights on work that comes with a re higher regulatory environment, unfortunately. And so I think that's where the impact comes in. And I think that's sometimes where it can be hard to find a good balance. Yeah, uh, I, I, I appreciate that, Dave and Rich. That's, that's all ask uh, there seems to be this um synonymous piece with uh regulation breeds the need for platform engineering or whatever you may call it right this kind of cultural process and tooling alignment where you're all uh, driven by one north star um, object like uh, objective and goal which is compliance against some regulation and that uh, for for better words kind of drives a very, very kind of single-minded view of okay well we need to 
prioritize this piece of our of our work this quarter of this this month and that's certainly I, I think David you've, you've been talking about this for, for a number of months with with us around fed ramp compliance is really important and so if we could all um leverage uh, that kind of single focus to, to do this organization a, a lot of these um a lot of the requirements kind of look look and feel like um platform engineering um maybe just in the last 90 seconds or so leave people with uh, a bit of kind of practical um advice um, if i maybe richard let's start with you uh kind of in, in in 30 seconds or 45 seconds or less um what advice would you give to people um or to uh, to others or friends in an organization to um uh, do, do things better to um, focus themselves on making something better or by, or, or by making a shift to platform engineering? I think the single most important thing is to have a metric, be it ENPS, be it satisfaction, something like that, which just measures how much your users like your product, your platform. Um, and if that's going up, you're doing something right. If that's plateauing or going down, you're doing something wrong. Um, Dave, I hope I haven't spoke, stolen your answer. No, that was, that was a really good answer. I would say, listen to your customers and don't get hung up on terminology. Cause if you start saying like, yeah. oh, I have to do platform engineering or I have to do DevOps, just make sure it's serving the needs of the business, um, and not the other way around. I, I love that. I, I think kind of identifying and using uh, the metric, use developer survey, NPS, um, build times, whatever maybe. Find your find your north star metrics. Excellent. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining with us. Um, uh, one last thing before we go, um, if you haven't registered for the last in the series, um, you can use the banner below that's just appeared, or go to cloudsmith.com. Uh, again, Dave, Richard, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we'll be speaking again over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.